Angie Thomas wrote a masterpiece in my eyes. Uh, she got uh, she got it right and got it she got it honest. And I've often said, and I said this to Angie. For her as a black woman raised by her mother, she could have easily made this story about the mother and the daughter overcoming those obstacles and excluded the male influence and the male presence altogether. And I, and I, and I told I thanked her for including the black male presence uh, in this film and making uh, this uh, a part of the film. And so I, I was very, I was very proud of that. And and she, all she was saying was that she wanted to honor the men in her family who had influenced her. And so, in just in knowing that, I realized that I, I was in turn, you know, honoring the men who had helped raise me, as well as the women who had helped raise me as well. And again. There is no right or wrong, there is only truth, and all we try to do is just be honest and, uh, and, tell us, and give as much truth as possible. But uh, overall, I'm very proud of this film. Basketball, football player, professional athlete, or something you know, like that, and then you go through the whole rote um, thing of, you know, I'm gonna be a doctor or a lawyer or something like that. Um, based on what you hear others say is like the cool thing to be. And then, um, and then I stopped dreaming and I just started living, quite honestly. You know, I mean, you have to kind of, you know that you can do anything you want that you set your mind to, but at the end of the day, by the time I got in and out of high school, I realized I just had to do it, whatever it was going to be. Like, it didn't matter, but I just had to do something and put my full, my heart, my soul into it and just do it, quite honestly. I think at the time, I think what Star wanted to do was, as she said, she wanted to be her authentic self. Now, interestingly enough, I'll be honest with you, I don't think at, at Star at 16 knew who that was. So, but I think it was just the, the, her being able to just explore the unknown at every turn. Do you know what I mean? So again, I, I think as, as young, I would imagine as young people when you have to go into sort of that foreign territory, if you will, um, when you don't even know who you are yet, but then you have to put this mask on who you think you are. Right, and so it, you, you have trouble in, the, in turn really finding you, like developing into yourself. And I think, so I think she wanted to have time to find who she was as a young woman and as a young black woman, you know, as well. Um, and, and then, you know, I think it was more of, of just discovering, you know, the history and all of, the, all of those things of who she was and how she would go about incorporating that into her daily life. You know, um, I think that as we, as in especially all the young people in here, as you learn about your history, you learn about where you come from, uh, you learn about uh, you know, slavery, and you learn about uh, uh, Reconstruction and uh, Jim Crow and all of those things, and how does that knowledge of who we are, of who we were, of where what we once was or what we might have been if, right? The histories and hopes. How do you use that information to inform your daily life, you know, and then life as you as you get older and not let it be a hindrance, you know, to you. And I think that's what she was sort of dealing with, uh, and not letting sort of the history of her blackness hold her back and restrict her. I think that's something that a lot of us, even now, even as a grown man, you sort of try to fight, you know. What you know, the history of where we come from, what we've done, dealt with, but still trying to move forward and still be, quite honestly, just authentically black. You know, authentically wherever you come from. 
you know, and still living, coexisting in the world as it's changing, too. I, you know, I got two boys, and that I'm tr I'm going to be charged with my with my wife and I uh, with the responsibility of raising them into, hopefully into young men and into men. And uh, <clears throat> I know that that's going to be necessary, and it's just a reality. Yeah, I'll add to that. Um, it's not a one-time talk. It's ongoing, right? And it's not because my boys are 20 and 18 next week. And it's not because of any one particular police department. It's because there's over 18,000 agencies in this country that don't adhere to the same, we all, of course, we abide by the Constitution, but we don't receive the same training. Some might be in a small town of two some might be, you know, it, so there's so much variance on how policing is applied throughout the country. We're not going to be stagnant as a people. We're not going to face the same things. Our children aren't going to face the same things at six that they're going to face as young men trying to not find themselves. I mean, I was known for, I, I was looked at crazy by my peers because I said my biggest fear, one of my biggest fears would be when my oldest son at the time, so he's 20, got his driver's license when he started driving because he now has this increased independence to go out and be in the world. Now he's in Atlanta. I'm nowhere near him, right? But it's a different conversation for different phases in life. And I'm a chief of police. My kids have been cops kids their entire lives. So it doesn't matter what we do. We're still parents first. And the reality is what it is. And that's why it's important for us to continue to have these dialogues to make sure that hopefully one day the, the conversation changes at some point. But we still have to recognize and acknowledge that there's bias in the world. And we are not always aware of it. And it might not be here in Portland, it might not be here in Oakland, but it might be somewhere else in the world. And we know as Portland police officers that anything that happens anywhere else in this country impacts us here and the lens um, of, of how we do our jobs here.